Hey everyone, everybody. Hope you're all well. Um, if you remember the the last evening um, we finished up, we were talking about value. We were talking about the idea of non-value, and um, we started to just talk about customer, and we talked about the importance of customer, and we just started to look at one of the um, the models or one of the first uh, ideas about this idea of customer and customer service. So let's have a look at this. Um, this is a model that was developed by a Japanese person by the name of Kano. And what he was doing is he was trying to figure out, you know, as customers, as individuals, we all have different expectations. Uh, imagine if somebody buys food, if somebody buys a car, there are different expectations. So what he did is he studied a lot of people, a lot of ourselves, and he came to the conclusion that as individuals, we have different expectations and we have three different types of expectations. And the first one he describes is basic expectations. You know, imagine you buy food in, in a supermarket. You expect it to be within its sell by date. You expect it to be fresh, for example. You know, if you rent a hotel room, for example, you would expect things like some place to make tea. You would expect internet, a television, an ensuite, uh, all of these things. So the idea being here that when you buy it, when you ask for it, you expect it to be there. Um, if it's not there, you're going to be extremely disappointed. If it, is, if it is there, you're not going to be any happier because you assumed it was going to be there in the first place. So that's what he would describe as a basic need. So the idea is if it's there, your satisfaction doesn't go up. But if it's not there, all of a sudden you get very dissatisfied. The second one he describes is what's known as a performance need. And the way that works basically is the more you can give me, the more I'm willing to pay for it. Think of a car, a car with greater fuel economy, maybe the more you're willing to pay for it. A phone with a longer battery life, room size maybe, the bigger the room, maybe the more you're going to pay for it. But again, in that case, the corollary is important as well. So if you buy a car and the fuel economy is very poor, then you probably aren't willing to spend an awful lot of money on it. If you buy a phone and the battery life is very poor, then you know that's a good reason not to pay an awful lot of money for it. And the third one he described was what was known as a delighter. Didn't even know it was possible. Never even asked for it. Um, and you gave it to me. And you probably gave it to me for free. So this could be, you know, free television on your phone, free movies, uh, free upgrade. You rent a hotel room, you automatically get an upgrade. You get a flight, you automatically get an upgrade. You get a meal, you automatically get a free bottle of wine. You're delighted if you get it. But if you don't get it, no problem, because you never asked for it in the first place. It was no big deal. So if you try to kind of visualize these three things, and, and you'll see why we want to do this now in a second. So if you drew a graph, for example, and sorry, let me go back one there. On that graph, if you imagine that on the, um, on the y-axis, what we're going to do is we're going to have satisfaction. So you can see here that as it moves in the positive y, you're going to be more satisfied. As it goes in the opposite direction, you're going to be more dissatisfied. And in the x-axis, it either works very, very well, or it's there in increasing quantities as you progress along the x-axis. Or the opposite, if you go in the negative x direction, it either doesn't work, or it's not there. There's smaller quantities. And let's look at what we talked about in terms of the basic expectations, or the must-haves we can describe them as. So basically what they're saying here is you get no points if you get it right because we expected it to be there in the first place. But we are going to be very, very upset if it isn't there or if it doesn't work. So like I said, if it's there, um, then the person isn't going to be any more satisfied. But all of a sudden, if something happens, if it isn't there, all of a sudden I'm going to be very dissatisfied. Okay. So, you know, could be something basic, uh, picture quality, um you know, internet quality, food quality, something like that. The green one is what we described as the more desirable, you know, the performance need. The more you can give me, the more I'm willing to pay for it. So more high quality channels on your satellite subscription, longer battery life, you know, extended range in a car, for example. You can see there that, you know, there's a correlation between uh, the more that's there and the more satisfied I'm going to be. But you can also see in the opposite direction, 
things that I'm indifferent about, things that I, I don't care, I don't want, for example. You know, go back to the, the, the television situation and think of all of the hundreds of channels that are there that you don't want, but you're actually paying for them. You know, you just, you're completely indifferent about them. Or you buy a phone and the battery life is very poor. You buy a car and the, you know, the fuel economy is very, very poor as well. So in this case, you know, the, the less that's there, the more dissatisfied you are. And the last one we described is this delighted or, delight or, or an added bonus. Didn't expect it. Not disappointed if it's missing. So, you know, if it's not there, I'm not disappointed. But all of a sudden, if you give it to me, I'm hugely delighted. Okay. And the interesting thing about this is that, you know, think of these added bonuses. So you get a free upgrade in a hotel. You get a free upgrade um, on, a, on a flight, for example. Guess what happens the next time you go along and you book that flight? There's almost this expectation, well, I got it the last time. So all of a sudden, some of those things come over here. They become must-haves. We get used to getting things like that. So the point of, of looking at all of this and trying to understand all of this is that it's really, really important when you look at any customer and you look at the product or the service that you provide, there are fundamental must-haves that you must have. If you don't have those, you're not in the game. No point in saying that, you know, this is an advantage if everybody else is exactly the same thing. There are things that people are willing to pay more for, and you need to understand what those are. There are things that people that are not willing to pay for, and ideally you don't offer those. And then there are things that you offer as bonuses, either to retain people's loyalty or to get people into that market in the first place. But knowing that we're going to change our minds in the future. Because what we like today, what we expect today as customers, there's a reasonable chance that that's going to change in the future. And the expectation is that demand is going to go up. So if you're buying a mobile phone today with a 20 megapixel camera, more than likely when you come around to buying another phone in a year's time, two years time, whatever it is, chances are you'll be looking for a 24 megapixel camera, 28 megapixel camera, and you probably don't even need it. But there is almost this, that's this starting point. That's the threshold that I'll start from. So it's really more important to do that. Now, the challenge of all of this as well is, if you think of all of the customers out there, for whatever reason, have lost sight of being able to provide a customer with what they want. And in some cases, what's happened is technology has changed the model that they have and they never adapted to that. And in some cases, given, you know, the COVID situation for the last year, the model that they had, maybe they couldn't go online. Maybe they couldn't get raw materials, for example. So think of companies like HMV, for example. You know, um, HMV um, doesn't really exist anymore because the model that they use for selling music doesn't exist anymore. Nobody goes down to the high street to buy music anymore. You know, similarly with the likes of ExtraVision, Blockbuster, for example. The model has gone online. So whether it's iTunes, Spotify, whether it's uh, Netflix, uh, Android boxes, Kodi, XBMC, whatever it is, the model these days is you either rent music, you rent films, or you steal them, or you share them. That's the model. Um, if you look at companies like Kodak, for example, Kodak developed digital photography, but they never really saw it as catching on. Their expertise was in, in wet chemistry. Uh, wet photography and um, they just never bought into it and you know they pretty much disappeared because of that uh, you know think of all of the organizations who've gone by the wayside over the last year because people just can't travel people can't get out for example so like the Airbnb the pubs you know a, a lot of places as well uh, the media uh, because a lot of people just don't trust the media these days um, it's got you know so political um, you know, the, the media's purpose is not to tell the news anymore. It's, it's effectively a mechanism for advertising. And look at the people who survived and, you know, whether rightly or wrongly, the people who survived are the people who could adapt to the situation, particularly the people who could, who could operate online. So the upshot of all of these is, is really to think about, you know, the business you're in, the product that you offer, for example, and is it a product that genuinely offers value? And is it a product that will offer value in the future? And will something come along and completely blindside you and take that market away from you because somebody can do it better? 
Um, you know, absolutely no reason why Amazon wouldn't get into selling drugs, for example, you know, in terms of pharmaceutical products. They have the, the technology or they have the, the distribution center to be able to do it. I mean, technically, they could sell anything at all at this stage. Um, so it's really, really important to remember that because the upshot of it is if you don't keep up to date in terms of what a customer wants, and sometimes as customers, we don't even know what we want ourselves. Sometimes something new comes along and all of a sudden, you know, we, we realize that that's of an interest. So that's really important to understand that. So the first part we talked about is this idea of the customer. And we talked about this idea of the value, knowing that value changes and our perception of value changes. And it changes over time and it changes as we age and it changes depending on our generations. Different generations have different expectations of value. The next one we look at is this concept then of once you know who your customer is and once you know what they value, the question is how are you going to make it? How are you going to provide that service? Uh, how, you know, how is that going to work? So if I want to buy uh, television, for example, I could go to Harvey Norman and I could physically try and get that television uh, and buy it in Harvey Norman if they have it. Or what I could do is go online to Amazon and I could probably order it on Amazon and I probably know I would get it within two or three days. Um, so there are different ways to get the product. So this concept of the value stream is effectively how are you going to provide that product or service to the customer? So, you know, if I want to buy a television from Harvey Norman, yes, I could buy it online or I could physically go into the shop and see it or I could buy it on Amazon online or I could buy it probably from Samsung online. But, you know, if, if the only option was to physically go to a shop and collect it, maybe in the current climate, I'm less inclined to do that. So this notion of the value stream, and when you think about it, the value stream is all of the bits that are joined together that add value to the product, that make the product. And what we'll find now in a few minutes is that there are steps in every value stream some of them add value and some of them don't. And the ideal scenario is how do you obviously keep doing the things that add value and stop the things that don't. So let's have a look at this um, principle and then we look at the idea of flow and we look at the idea of pull and, and push. Like I said before, if you look at every business out there, it doesn't matter what it is, every business will follow this very simple model. And it always starts over here on the top right with a customer. And the customer is always going to have a demand for something. You know, they'll want something. And somebody somewhere will look at that demand and say, we can supply that to you. We can put a plan together to supply what you want. Whether that's furniture, whether that's tablets, doesn't matter what it is. Whether it's loans, doesn't matter what it is. But for that organization to be able to do that, so that's, you know, the, the area I've just circled there is effectively the, the planning department within that organization. What they have to do is they have to get raw materials from their suppliers. They just can't make it out of thin air. So they're going to go to all of their different suppliers. And what they're going to do is they're either going to get finished product or they're going to get raw materials or they're going to get something that they brand themselves. And when that arrives into their own organization, they're going to go through a series of steps to make the product or provide the service. Simple as that. And ultimately, it only makes sense if the customer gets what they want. Okay, so every single business out there, you can look at it like that. This is a value stream. The value stream is the process by which that information comes from the customer and it gets converted into a request, which then gets converted into a request for raw materials which then gets converted into a product or a service, which is then delivered to the customer. And in there, you can see that we can measure things, we can have targets, we can have inventory levels, we can have different steps. You know, every organization is going to be different. Every organization will have different challenges. They will get raw materials from different places. They will need different equipment, different people. There will be lots of different types of constraints. And, you know, the interesting thing here is that if you look at this, it is a loop. You know, it's a, it's a loop where something starts here 
And you can see that there are different people involved in different steps. It's unlikely that the person who takes the order will be the same person who will go and talk to the supplier who will then drive the truck and bring in all the raw materials and then make the product and then drive it back out to the customer. More than likely what's going to happen is there's going to be a whole series of people there. In each case, what you're doing is you're actually handing something over to the other person. So whoever takes in the, you know, the, the order from the customer, they're probably going to give it to somebody in planning. And the people in planning then are going to put together some sort of a list that goes to the supplier. And when that raw material comes in, and that's going to be brought in by somebody else, the people who take in the raw materials are going to do something with it. And then there's a group of steps where different people will do something with that product. So what you can see here is effectively it's a group of people who hand over something to somebody else. And ask yourself, you know, where else do we see that kind of idea of somebody handing something over to somebody else? And think of a relay race. And I'm going to mention the relay race in a second. And I want to use that kind of an analogy of a relay race. But let's look at this idea of uh, maybe um, one typical example would be, imagine a company out there and they want to hire people. So as a customer, they have a demand to say, we need to hire, say, 50 people. And we want to hire 50 people and we want them in the next six months. So that company, obviously, the hiring manager in that company just can't go out and find 50 people on their own. What they're going to do is they're going to put a demand out there somewhere and say, we have a demand for 50 people over the next six months. Could somebody help us to do that? So let's say, for example, a recruitment department or a recruitment agency sees that demand. It says, "Okay, we'll do that. We'll fulfill that for you. We'll help you to do that. So they look at the demand. They say, yeah, we can do that. For them to be able to do that, obviously, they need to know exactly what the type of people are. What's the order? What uh, are you looking for engineers? Are you looking for quality people? What are you looking for? So what they're going to do then is they're going to go to their suppliers. And their suppliers in this case are going to be agencies. So whether that's recruitment agencies, whether they're going to advertise in newspapers, online, maybe they go to their network, maybe they go to LinkedIn, for example. And really what they're trying to do is they're trying to generate CVs. They're trying to generate paperwork. So think of that paperwork as almost like raw material. You know, it's people behind the paper. And all of a sudden what happens is we get loads of CVs starting to come into, you know, this organization here. And what they do is they go through a process where they review the CV and then they call somebody for an interview, second interview. They do a selection. They offer a contract. They do a reference check. They do a medical. They agree a start date person is in the role and they're successful in the role. So ultimately, the customer here is happy. So remember what I said about the, the relay race earlier on. Think about how it works. We have all these different people, groups of people, different departments, for example. And really what we're doing is we're handing over information from one to the other. That's kind of the idea. So, you know, if you think of it in terms of a relay itself, think about what we have here. We have a group of people who have a goal, and their goal is very simple. How do we transfer the baton around a track, around a defined value stream? And the object of the exercise is how do we do it as quickly as possible, um, you know, with the minimum amount of fuss. So when we hand something over, we hand it over to the person exactly when they want it, where they want it, the time they want it. So as individuals, we do our jobs very, very well. But we also have to hand over to the next person who has to do their job very, very well as well. So this thing only works as an organization if everybody works together. And the handover process is very good and there are no errors and nobody drops the baton and everybody works together. So if you think about it, the ideal scenario would be like a relay race. And I suppose if you look at Amazon logistically, how they operate, you know, everything is connected together. The problem is if you look at most organizations, it would be kind of hard to say, well, you know, it's it works like a relay race. It probably would be more accurate to say it's more like a treasure hunt than a, than a relay race because it's really 
you know, the product you're looking for is out there somewhere. You figure out where it is. You figure out whether it's right or wrong. You figure out what you have to do with it. It doesn't really work. Not everything is connected well together. And that's always going to be a problem. So the ideal scenario here, when we look at the, the idea of the value stream, is we want things to flow. Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. They do their job very, very well. They hand it over and they guarantee it's right. So this notion of even having to inspect it, this notion of even having to look back and see is it, see is it okay and see is it in the right place, you shouldn't have to do that. Because in the ideal scenario, it's exactly where you want it, in the shape you want it, when you want it. And it's as simple as that. And that's in one way what we're trying to strive for when you look at the idea of a value stream. So like I said before, every value stream conceptually looks the same. Obviously, this is a very, very simplified version. We look at much more detailed versions the next night. They'll all start over here with the customer. They'll all have some sort of a planning controlling function. And that planning controlling function looks at the demand, but also what it does is it tells each of the individual steps within the organization what to do. Gives them an idea of what workload, you know, what orders to make, what product to make, when to make it. It organizes all of the scheduling, for example. And the other thing it does is it communicates to the suppliers. Again, standard stuff in terms of supply chain management. You know, nothing, nothing complicated about it. And we see later on that when we look at value streams, we can learn a lot about them. You know, what we can learn about them is we can see where the constraints are. We can see whether the customer demand fluctuates up and down or not. And if it fluctuates up and down, what do we do about it? And it also shows us what the internal steps are. And are some of those value added and some of them are not value added. And we're also interested in the, the bits between the steps. Because sometimes the bits between the steps are non-value added. We're waiting for something to be moved. We're waiting for something to heat up, to cool down, for example. You know, there can be gaps in there as well. So that piece is just as important as any others. And when you start to think about that, when you start to look at this idea of a value stream map being made up of value-adding activities and non-value-adding activities, then you get to think about this idea of waste. Because anything that is non-value-adding, technically then you can describe it as waste. If it's value-adding, it's value adding, you know, the person is willing to pay for it. But if it isn't value adding, then the person isn't really willing to pay for it. So, you know, if you look at the example down at the bottom here, reviewing a CV is probably a value adding activity. Probably a good thing to do. You know, doing a, an interview, either a first interview or a second interview, arguably is a good thing to do. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you send out the contract, for example, and if you're waiting for the... Uh, the contract to come back. So, sorry. So if you're waiting, for example, for the, you know, you might be waiting a week for the, the contract to come back. So, the, so the, the kind of the gap in the middle there, you know, offering the contract might only take a few minutes, but actually waiting for somebody to come back and confirm the contract or confirm the reference, that could take an awful long time. You know, think of it like, when you organize an interview and then you organize the second interview. So the interview might only take an hour, but the decision around the second interview or organizing a second interview might take a week. So in reality, what we have here is we have a series of process activities. Some of them add value and some of them don't add value, but particularly the ones that are, if they're not connected together, um, you know, think again of Amazon, Think of something on a conveyor belt. If something is physically connected, there's a reasonable chance that it's going to move fairly quickly. But if it's not connected, it could be a problem. Again, think of the pharmaceutical industry. You blend something in a, in a blender. Um, you might have something in a vessel, for, for example, in a reactor. Uh, if that's going to sit there for a day or two before it physically gets transferred into another reactor, into another vessel, for example, you know, trying to improve the, the blending time in the vessel trying to improve the process step arguably isn't of much benefit because it's going to sit there for two or three days. Um, might make far more sense to try and address that particular problem. So let's have a look at this notion of, of waste. And waste and, and non-value add. You know, when you think about it, it's really the same thing. If something doesn't add value, then clearly it's waste. And to get our head around this notion, let's 
talk about food for a second. Talk about something else that we can all kind of relate to. And let's look at the States. And let's ignore all of the food that the U.S. imports. You can imagine, obviously, the, the U.S. imports a huge amount of food. But if we just look at the amount of food they produce themselves, you know, just for themselves, the amount of food that they grow themselves, for example. And in that case, if you just looked at that, technically what actually happens in the States, they grow twice the amount of food that they need, ignoring all imports. Okay, So it would feed twice the amount of people that are actually in the States, what they grow. More than 40% of the food produced in the States is never eaten. If you look at landfill in America, about 17% of landfill is made up of food. And they spend somewhere in the region of $100 billion managing that 17% as a waste item. That's not the cost of growing the food in the first place. And you have about 46 million people out of, what, 340 million people on food stamps. They're hungry. That doesn't really make an awful lot of sense when you think about it. You know, there's so much food there being produced, but an awful lot of people never ever get to to eat it. If you look at Europe, that 40% is closer to 30%. Still a very, very large number. And then you'd wonder, why is that the case? Why is it that there is so much food being produced and people don't eat it? Well, um, partly people are fussy. Um, partly because too much of the wrong type of food is produced. Partly because of regulation. Um, Regulations about the size. Let's say, for example, if it's vegetables or fruit or something like that, there are regulations out there about the size, the shape, um, you know, whether it's ugly or not, um, whether it's blemished, um, you know, sell-by dates, all of these things. All of these things in one way generate an awful lot of waste. So as society, I suppose, the unfortunate thing is we have become quite wasteful. So the question really is, you know, if you asked yourself this question, what is the minimum amount of materials, time, space, facilities, capital, energy, whatever it is we need to make something? What's the minimum we need to develop, deliver a product or a service to your customer? Arguably, anything more than the absolute minimum is a waste because you don't need it. So if we spend more time developing a product or producing a service that nobody wants, that's a waste. If we make mistakes, if we overproduce too much inventory, if we use more space than necessary, more equipment than necessary, if people are doing the wrong things, if people are working improperly, and hundreds of other opportunities as well, technically any one of those things is a waste and nobody is willing to pay for that. So the idea here is how do you start to think like that? What is the the absolute minimum that you need to make a product or provide a service? Anything beyond that is a waste. And when you look at lean as a concept, originally lean talked about this idea of seven wastes. When you look at some earlier lean books, it talks about this notion of seven wastes. And you may have come across a person's name in there, a person by the name of Tim Wood. Uh, and he wasn't the, the minister for waste. But if you take the the first letter of the first seven, so you can see here that it's spelled as Tim Wood. And it was an acronym, really, that people used to use to remember some of the wastes. But in reality, there's other ones. Okay, So there isn't an acronym for some of the other ones. And in fact... You know, people move to 10, and to be honest, there's an awful lot more than 10. You know, there's different types of wastes. And even as society changes, you can diagnose different things as different types of waste as well. So let's have a look at a few of these in a bit more detail. Transport. Any unnecessary motion, movement of people, materials, documentation, information, anything like that required to complete a service. You know, think of the current situation. I mean, some of the... The positives, if I could use that term advisedly, the fact that these days, you know, the commute is okay. If you are working, if you can work from home, it's good. There are a lot of situations where people end up working from home. Now, that could be positive, it could be negative. But, you know, the amount of traveling that's going on there is is reduced quite a lot. So having to travel to meetings, you know, for example, when we meet, we meet online as opposed to having to physically meet or room for somewhere. So having to physically travel somewhere delivering information, moving materials 
in and out of a storage area or a warehouse, for example. You know, having to transfer something by hand as opposed to transferring something online. So any kind of physical transportation of something where the transport in itself doesn't make the product any better. So delivering a letter, you know, the delivery process doesn't make the letter any better. But obviously there are still situations where you physically have to do that. You know, if that can be emailed to you, all the better. Um, So that's what transport is. Inventory. Any inventory um, that, if you hold too much of it, anything that you have beyond what the customer requirement is, then it's a waste. You know, technically it's a waste. So if you carry too much in, so too much physical stock. So by the time you watch this video, um, Valentine's cards, um, Valentine's cups and all that kind of stuff will actually become a waste because Valentine's Day will have passed. Prior to Valentine's Day and probably up to five or six o'clock, those items will have a value. And they might even have a a bit of a premium value. So, for example, a Valentine's card um, might have a value. But then as you get into the day after, all of a sudden it doesn't have a value. Flowers will still have a value, but there won't be the same demand for it. Uh, You know, things that say Happy Valentine's Day, all of a sudden they have no demand for them anymore. So if you have too much physical stock of that, technically, particularly if it has a shelf life, it's going to be a waste. In the service side of things, you know, too many queries, too many customer applications, too many people phoning up to say my broadband doesn't work, for example. That's all work to be done. That's inventory. Multiple repositories of information that aren't linked together. You know, physical online storage of information, duplication of information. So sometimes if you're, you know, you know, if you're releasing a batch, you still have to hold on to all of that data for that batch. Sometimes you do it physically. Sometimes people will store it online. But even if you do it online, that still has to be physically stored. It still requires energy to scan it, to store it somewhere, to secure it, for example. And if you look at the Internet, when you think of the Internet, I mean, there's positives about the Internet. But as a process, it's highly inefficient. Because if you think about it, think of any one incident that happens. So maybe there's an accident somewhere, there's a, you know, somebody makes a decision, there's a game, football match, something like that. So an event happens. But if you think about on the internet, that one event isn't recorded in one place. It's recorded maybe in millions of places. So different news agencies, different newspapers, different people all comment on the same thing. And the event itself might be the same. What might be different is people's, Um, you know, views on it, which might be different. But when you think about it, it's it's a very, very inefficient process. You'd imagine that somebody would come up with a a much more efficient internet where it has an event and that's stored somewhere. And then other people could have an interpretation about that one event. But that one event would store all of the data where people could go in and fact check, is it true or not? To me, it would make far more sense than what's there at the moment. Motion. Think about any process that is inefficient. Bad layout, ergonomic issues, safety issues. Um, you're moving, you know, a box from one level to another bo- to another level. You have to take something out of a package, put it into a package. Um, anywhere you have a poor layout. You know, your your office could be in one place and your printer could be down the corridor. The people that you normally talk to could be in another building. Um, the material comes in on one side of the building, it has to be transported to the other side of the building. The samples are taken into another building. Um, you know, just it's released from somewhere else. So anywhere you have bad layout, ergonomic issues, um, anything that generates defects, anything like that. Now, it's not just in the physical sense. So, you know, think of a poor workflow, poor software design, poor website, for example. Uh, poor form online doesn't make an awful lot of sense that in itself is going to generate waste it's going to generate errors as well so like i said things like poor office layout you know having to walk from one location to another location to get access to something having to revisit people anything like that anything where there's movement going on movement of information movement of people movement of product 
movement of equipment. That can generate waste. Waiting, we can all relate to. So you're waiting for something, waiting to get access to something, waiting for information, waiting because there is something downstream that doesn't have the capacity to handle the volume of activity that's going on. So imagine you're in a queue at a supermarket. The reason why you're waiting is the, um, the person who is probably scanning in the shopping doesn't have the capacity or the beat rate to be able to handle the volume of people that are coming down. Remember on the M50 before when the toll bridge used to be a physical toll bridge, like it is up near Drogheda or Dundalk, um, you know, the idea was that you would physically stop, you would pay your money, and then you would move on again. The problem was that no matter how fast and no matter how wide they made the M50, the volume of cars going up and down the M50 was going to be defined by the beat rate or the, the rate through the toll bridge. You know, think of it like if you have a, a large pipe and you have a very narrow pipe and if you have water flowing into the large pipe and that's going to go into the small pipe, you know, it doesn't matter how much you push the water in there, it's going to be defined by the diameter of that pipe there. So waiting anywhere where you have some sort of a downstream delay, that's always going to cause you problems as well. Overproduction. You just make too much stuff and there's no demand for it. So somebody out there might still be making Valentine's cards. You know, they're wasting their time because there won't be any demand for it. Overproduction. The operation just keeps going after a point where they should have actually stopped because there was no more demand for it. You know, you end up making products beyond what's required, which ultimately would be scrapped. Or sometimes what happens is you make product too early and you end up using the raw materials that you need for a genuine order as well. Particularly if you make product that is a short shelf life. So if you're making, you know, uh, fresh food, for example, something like that, that it's going to go off very, very quickly. If you make something that is a long shelf life, then... You can still hold on to it, but you still have to get rid of it. You still have to sell it, and you'll end up probably selling it quite cheaply. But that makes sense if you can think of a physical item. You know, we make too many cars, and there's no demand for it. But what about if you were a service organization? If you were, um, you know, if you were a bank, and you were providing mortgages? If you were an insurance company, you're providing insurance policies. How could you overproduce something? You know, it's almost like... How could you overproduce in, in that scenario? But you could do it in the sense that you could do too much preparation, too much advertising, too much research, for example. You could have too many people in that scenario, but there's no demand for it. So this idea of overproducing something, you, you know, you can do too much beyond what's required, whether that's a service or whether it's physically making something. You know, so... Producing product or functionality or services that there is no requirement for. Continuing production just because everything is going fine. Continuing to offer that service if there is, you know, even though there's no demand for it. So that was overproduction. This one sounds similar, overprocessing. The easiest way to think about overprocessing is think of rework. So overprocessing means that you have to go back and do something to that product or service because it wasn't right first time. So let's say, for example, you were blending a batch and you looked at the output. Maybe it's not blended properly yet. So you have to go back and blend it again. There's something not right. Uh, you're packaging something and there's an issue there. You have to go back and rework it. You have to reprocess it. You have to handle it again. You have to do something to correct something. So you have to go back and fix an error is really what you're trying to do. You're correcting some defect in the documentation. So somebody applies for something and the name, the address, the phone number is wrong and they have to go back and correct it. So you're reworking something, you know, your customer support, for example. You might be saying, well, how could customer support be a, a waste? Surely that's something that's very, very useful. You know, if you can help somebody, you'd imagine that would be very, very good. But think of the scenario where you got, um, say, broadband, and you got a self-installed broadband from Virgin. 
So the idea is you ring them up and say, look, I'm interested to get broadband. And what they'll do is they'll send a box out to you. And it's effectively broadband in a box. And it's very well configured. And you connect it all up yourself. And, and, you know, all going well, it should work. But if it doesn't work, what you do is you ring customer service. And even though customer service might be very nice, and they get you sorted within 10 or 15 minutes, the very fact that it didn't work first time was a problem. Somebody still had to pay for that customer service. Maybe it been you, but ultimately that cost has been carried somewhere. It's the same almost if you look at inspection. If you look at every, you know, imagine somebody making syringes, vials, tablets, all of those are going to have to be inspected. And somebody would say, well, surely inspection is a value-added activity. Well, actually, no, because ideally it would work right first time. But because we can't guarantee the process means that we absolutely have to inspect. So I'm not saying for one second, don't do it. But what I am saying is, in the true sense of the word, it's a non-value-adding activity. Uh, But I'm not saying don't do it because you can't guarantee the output. Ideally, what you'd want is you'd have a process that you could control that would automatically guarantee an output. That would be the ideal scenario. Can't always guarantee that. So that's what over-processing is. is It's effectively rework. It's what you're doing. The other one is the defect itself, you know, so a lot of the things we talked about there just produce defects. Um, you know, it's that could be an issue. So any kind of a product or aspect of the service that doesn't conform to your specification, you know, too hot, too cold, I buy a cup of coffee, it's the wrong, I order a latte, I get something else. Um, you know, I order a particular component, I get the wrong one. There's something wrong with it, it doesn't work, it's defective. The information is wrong, gets delivered to the wrong location, whatever whatever it is, it's defective. I came across this, I'm probably in the way here in the um but I came across this in, in Starbucks. Um I'm not a huge fan of Starbucks, I would say. And Starbucks is an interesting organization where you you know, you go in and you ask for a cup of coffee and you have to go through this complicated process of giving them your name. And I'd be saying, well, you know, surely it would make more sense to write latte on the side of the cup as opposed to writing my name. So they'll say, look, what's your name? I say, my name is Finbar. And then after about five or ten minutes, I hear somebody saying, cup of coffee here for Sinbad or some variation of the name. They'll get the name wrong. But I came across this this interesting photograph a while back where somebody was in Starbucks and they went in and said, my name is Mark, Mark with a C. And that's what they wrote on the side of the cup. And I suppose the point I was making is sometimes organizations have processes that just don't make an awful lot of sense. And invariably, they generate an awful lot of errors themselves. We just like, or some people like to make things complicated. And the simpler the process, you can make it, the better. Um, It's a bit like McDonald's these days. They've started to move to this idea that, you know, when you go into McDonald's and you order the food yourself. I'm not sure I like that anymore. I much prefer to say it to somebody because I'm probably far more likely to make an error. And it definitely doesn't make it any quicker. Um, you know, I just, I still have to wait for the thing um, um, to be made, for example, as well. So that's what a defect is. So there's a couple of other ones, you know, beyond the Tim Wood. Reprioritization. I'm sure you've all been in this situation. So reprioritization is, you know, somebody says to you, the next three weeks I want you to focus on this. Forget about everything else. This is the most important thing. Just focus on this activity. And then about two or three weeks into it, somebody says, stop whatever you're doing. I want you to focus on something else. This is the most important thing. So this constant reprioritization and all of that work that is done during that time is a complete waste. You know, you don't, you're not going to use it. So it all goes to waste. And whether it's a result of poor planning you know, poor management, poor forecasting, poor visibility. It could be because environmental things change, you know, medical things change, viruses happen. Um, But it generates an awful lot of waste. And that waste is usually something that you can't really regain. So all of that work you did, all of that preparation you did, you know, probably didn't result in anything. People skills. And again, you might say, well, why is that a waste? And I'm not saying it's a waste, but what I'm saying is that as individuals, we develop an awful lot of skills, you know, whether that's 
um, engineering skills or accounting skills or web design skills, doesn't matter what it is. But if you think about the jobs we work in, majority of those jobs utilize very, very few of the skills that we have. Think of all of the time we've spent learning different things, developing our expertise in different areas, and then we go into a job which in one sense could be very, very narrow focus. And that in itself is a waste because we just don't utilize the skills that we have. And sometimes it's worse in the bigger organizations. You know, if you work in procurement, that's all you do. You do procurement stuff. But you could be very good at leadership. You could be very good at confrontation management. You could be very good at web design. But if the job description doesn't require it, then all of a sudden it doesn't really get used. In the smaller organizations, it's not as bad because you have the ability to diversify and do different things. So again, whether that's you know poor planning, whether it's job restrictions or restrictions in jobs, even think like meetings. Think about the amount of times you go to meetings that you may not necessarily have organized. And they're very ineffective. And think about all of the energy and the skills required to get those people into those rooms. And if they can't make a decision, you know, that's a waste. Poor leadership, lack of accountability, all of these things can result in that as well. And I suppose you have the situation as well where people skills do get out of date. You know, think about you're all upskilling these days in different areas. Um, think skills like process improvement. Previously, that would have been a job. Now it's a competency. Uh, data analytics would have been a job. Now it's a competency. Um, you know, so skills change. And it's really important to, to develop the skills we have because we could end up with a lot of skills ultimately that don't have any value. And the last one is energy. And again, I'm not saying for one second that energy is a waste. But what I am saying is we waste energy. So if you think of the nine that we've just looked at there, transport, inventory, movement, motion, all of those, all of those consume energy in some shape or form. So the energy to heat something, you know, to light, to move something, to transport it, to make it, to rework it, for example, that all consumes energy in some shape or form as well. The energy to make a decision, brain power, think about it, right? The energy to make business decisions, that consumes energy. You know, the energy that's wasted in terms of in ineffective meetings. And so all of that stuff consumes energy. Okay? And the problem then is, you know, if we waste energy, obviously that's going to be an issue for us. So when you think about it, you know, there's actually more there because when you think of your own organization, um, you know, I can think of a few other ones. There's one there that we would describe as scatter. A scatter could almost be just literally walking from one place to another place to another place. Do you ever look at nurses in hospitals? And they spend most of their time walking. Um, simple things. Do you ever watch a builder? Do you ever watch a carpenter, a plumber uh, come to the house to do something? spend most of the time walking in and out of the van because they forget something. Uh, you know, so there's an awful lot of places where people just literally walk and it might be jumping from one document to another document or it might be jumping from one place to another place. Sometimes there are barriers to communication. So you can't talk to somebody unless you talk to somebody else at the same level who will then talk to somebody. Sometimes hierarchical organizations can be a problem. Sometimes you literally have the wrong tools. You know, think these days if somebody doesn't have broadband, if somebody doesn't have online teams, for example, you know, you're not going to be able to do your job that's going to be waste. Handoffs can be waste. We'll talk about handoffs later on when we talk about the concept of SMED. But handing over information, if they're wrong, useless information. Think of all of the reports sometimes people write and nobody reads. That's a waste. Waiting we've talked about. Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is a waste because somebody says, I know exactly what the problem is, therefore I, exact, I know exactly what the answer is, and it's wrong. But they just guess at stuff. Testing to specifications is a kind of an interesting one. You'd say, well, surely that's important. But what I'm saying here is that if you test something to a specification that's too tight, that's not required, you're going to end up throwing something away. So, you know, looking at food, for example, and because there's a blemish on it, because it's too big, too small, because somebody has a specification out there for it, does it really make any sense to do that? And discarded knowledge is interesting as well. You know, think about 
if you've ever worked in a company and you've left that company, most cases, all of that knowledge that you've learned over the years is all gone. It's all in your head. I think as organizations become more automated, more of that information now resides within the process as opposed to within the person. But if you have an organization that's very, very dependent on individuals, that's a dangerous thing. You know, I'm sure you've heard the adage that what do you do with somebody who's disp- indispensable? You get rid of them. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but what I'm saying is that, you know, if you put all of your energy and your knowledge in one person, that becomes a weak link if anything happens. So to kind of summarize what I'm talking about here in terms of waste, <coughs> excuse me, I want you to think a little bit differently when you look at any process or any kind of a value stream. And I want you to look at it differently. I want you to look at it really with a different pair of eyes. So rather than just seeing what are the, the blocks involved, I want you to start thinking about, first of all, what's the customer looking for? And then I want you to start thinking about what are the process steps involved? And when you look at some of those process steps, you'll realize there's some process steps that are non-value added. And the question is, can we eliminate them? Can we stop doing them? Can we exterminate them? Can we stop, you know, stop doing those things? And if you can, great, because it simplifies it. The next thing is, whatever else is left, can you minimize it? Can you minimize the amount of waste? So, for example, if you were set up a a packaging line and you were using a lot of raw material or if you were using a lot of tablets, syringes, vials, um, you know, blisters, for example, thermoform, if you were using a lot of that to set up a, a packaging line, technically that's a waste. Can you minimize that? You'll still have something left over. The question then is, can you recycle it? Can you do something with it? I will argue the best way to recycle something is don't make it in the first place. Some people generate businesses out of recycling and what they do is they encourage people to make waste. That's not the right thing to do. The best way to recycle something is don't make it in the first place. Okay, but sometimes, you know, people advertise and say this is recyclable. Great, but it would be far better if it didn't exist in the first place. So, you know, if it doesn't, if something has a, a value for just a short period of time, ideally don't make it in the first place. And then what you have is whatever else is left, you have to manage it. But sometimes what we try and do is we try and manage the whole thing. And it's just not possible to do it because it's too big. You have to break it down into chunks. And you have to look at it in terms of the value stream, which we'll do later on. And then you'll have to identify where the constraints are. And then you focus on the constraints. That's what we're trying to do. It's almost like, you know, imagine you're in the... Uh, the 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 traffic control center in some city, and you're looking at all of the 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 junctions, all of the bottlenecks, all of the areas where the person is going on their journey, and you're going to see where the constraints are. Ideally, if you can control the traffic lights, ideally if you can make flow things better, that's ideally what you want. In the same way, we want to be able to look down on an organization, and we want to be able to see the the journey. And we want to be able to see where those constraints are along that journey and what can we do to make things flow. It's as simple as that. That's our job. So we'll talk more about the value stream in a few minutes. And the idea here is that, you know, again, we just need to look at what's that process. And maybe the right thing to do here is come up with a completely different process. You know, rather than fixing what you have and trying to improve what you have, Maybe you need to start again. Maybe you need to do something completely different. Because the fear here as well is somebody could come in and just take away all of your customers by doing something completely different. You know, think of the the HMV situation, the the ExtraVision situation. Think of all the situations where maybe Amazon has come in and just taken all of the customers from uh, physical, you know, brick and mortar stores, for example. You know, and the chances are This has been going on for a year. So, you know, people may never go back to brick and mortar stores again. Uh, People have almost got used to not doing that. So that's what a value stream is all about. Let's have a look at this idea of of flow and talk a bit about this idea of pull and, and push. I'm sure you've heard of a pull system or a push system. And again, if you think of the word flow, for example, you know, what comes to mind? Blood flow, water flow, uh, cash flow knowledge flow, information flow. In all of these cases, we want things to flow. 
Because if it doesn't flow, if there's a blockage, there's a problem. You know, if you have a blockage in an artery, that's a problem. If you have a blockage in your sink, if you have a blockage in your central heating system, if you have a blockage in a river, you know, you don't want that. You want things to flow. Again, if you think of buying something off Amazon, I think it's fair to say it flows from the time you order it. Um, you've, you know, by the time you go in, go into the website, order what you want and log back out again and go into your email, there's an email in there which says we've already dispatched your product. You know, that clearly does flow. So let's make the distinction between the two of them and try and understand is one better than the other. So let's look at a push system. <clears throat> so imagine you're going to push something. And a push system is a scenario where you've made something, you've produced goods based on a projection, <clears throat> based on a forecast, based on a forecast that you probably did a long time ago. And basically what you're going to do then is you're going to tell production to make a certain quantity of items based on the plan that you came up with a while back. And then what we're going to do is we now need to get rid of them because we made them. Go back to the scenario that I just talked about, about Valentine's Day. So um, all of the supermarkets, all of the stores about six or eight months ago had to place orders with their suppliers about for flowers, for chocolates, for Valentine's cards. And they made an estimate. And the estimate may have been right or it may have been wrong. And, you know, they were trying to think about, will we still be in lockdown or won't we be in lockdown? So what would the volume be? So what they do is they make an estimate. And they'll make that product and that'll be in the stores. And what they will do is, as it gets closer to Valentine's Day, they will try and push everything. You know, they'll put it right in front of your face. They will try and reduce it at a certain point. Because when it gets to the day after Valentine's Day, that product has no value anymore. So if you look at the inventory scenario, you know, what happens is you start off and you make it based on whatever the demand is going to be. And then what you do is you literally push it through the organization. The problem, though, is when it gets to where, whether it's the warehouse, whether it's closer to where the, the store is, it's all going to start to pile up. And if the customer out here, you know, doesn't consume the product or buy the product at the rate that it's being produced, you're going to end up with an awful lot of waste. So think of most supermarkets, for example, and you'd wonder, you know, if you look at the volume of, of particularly fresh food, flowers, cakes, anything like that, look at the volume that they have and the expectation to have fresh food there always. There must be a huge amount of waste at the end of every day and how they manage that can be quite difficult. So that's what a push system is. Again, you know, the other example I have there is think of Christmas. Think of, you know, when do most shops order for Christmas? Well, they order back in January or February uh, of that year. And they do it based on, you know, what they would kind of see, what, what they would kind of forecast. So they would look out and they would say, estimate what it is. You know, they're even trying to estimate what's the product going to be. Is it going to be a PlayStation 5 or what is it going to be? So they're going to place their orders. And then all of a sudden, you know, coming to September, October time, those orders start to appear. So if this is the warehouse that the supermarket has, you know, they're going to have large quantities of this product probably in their warehouse that they're going to have to get rid of and they're going to try and push it out the door. That's what a push system is. So you can see here it's not ideal. And it all gets back to the quality of the forecast. You get a bad forecast, you'll end up with a huge amount of material that you won't be able to get rid of. Okay. Um, if you underestimate the forecast, that can be a problem as well because you just won't have um, enough material. Now, you'll sell everything you have, but you just won't have enough, um, you won't be able to meet the demand. Pull system is the opposite. Pull system is a system in which production is initiated by the person or the organization who consumes the goods. So it's effectively pulled out of the organization. You know, think of Starbucks, for example. When you go into Starbucks and you order a cup of coffee, they only make the cup of coffee when you order. So they don't, they don't make it earlier on and then try and push it out the door. 
Okay, they'll only make it when there's a demand for it. That works fine in some cases, but imagine you were in uh, a pharmacy and somebody walks in and says, I want a box of anodins. You know, you can't really go out the back and make an anodin. You can't really ring up Pfizer or whatever and say, will you make an anodin for me and send it down? It doesn't really work. But the ideal scenario would be that you would only make something if there was a demand for it. That would be the ideal scenario. But to do that, when you think about it, you know, the lead time to be able to make it would be very, very quick. So if somebody orders a cup of coffee, it only takes a couple of minutes to make a cup of coffee. So in that scenario, that's okay. Somebody goes into um, a car showroom and orders a new car and wants a certain configuration. That's going to take several weeks or several months for that to happen because that car is non-standard. That order has to go back to manufacturing and then they will make it specifically for that particular customer. The advantage of a pull system is you have minimal inventory, you have minimal stock there. Um, The downside can be that the lead time can be long if you want something. So in reality, the ideal scenario, I think, is a combination between the two of them. You know, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to minimize the inventory that you have um, by only making something or providing the service if there's a demand for it. And to be honest, the the ideal scenario is if you have a very good forecast and if you can make it early, you can probably make it cheaper. That might be okay. The ideal scenario then would be if you had a very, very short cycle time. If you can make something very quickly, you know, that's good. That's all the better. So the faster you could make it and the closer you are to a pull system, all the better. So if you can make something very, very fast, such that if a customer asks for something, you can turn it around very, very quickly. If it takes you a long time to do it, then you're going to be more dependent on a forecast. In the pharmaceutical industry, if you think about components that have a very long lead time, active ingredient, for example, a lot of companies order it and it could be a year uh, delivery time, could be a year and a half delivery time sometimes. So in a case like that, you're going to base it on some sort of a forecast And you could be wildly right or wildly wrong, depending on what's going on. You know, think of the last year, the demand for PPE, the demand for sanitizer, you know. um, And then there was demand, there was things out there that there would normally be a demand for, and then all of a sudden there was no demand for it. So it's trying to find the right balance between the two of them. The ideal scenario is you'd let the customer pull the product. But there are downsides to that as well, because... If you're waiting for the customer to order it, then it may actually be too late. So it's trying to find the right balance between the two of those. So think about where we've come from. We've talked about this idea of value. We've talked about this idea of non-value. We've talked about the notion of um, um, the value stream, and we'll come back to the value stream again later on. Um, And we've talked about the idea of waste. So really what we want to start thinking about now is, well, what are the tools out there to improve our process? You know, so how do you do that? I mean, fine to talk about value stream, but how do you physically do that? And if you look at any process, you know, so what we've been kind of talking about up to now is that, you know, any process out there, let's say, for example, it's made up in this case where you have one, two, three, you have five different process steps in this process. So you can see that, you know, the request is going to come in here. So technically, what you'd want to be able to do is you want to look at this process and figure out what's the the best way to lay it out. How many steps do we need? Is this a physical process? Is this an online process? But, you know, something to do with how, how is it, what's the layout look like? So we're going to talk about a concept called 5S. 5S comes from five Japanese words. We'll explain them later on. But that looks at things like layout the design of something, the design of the facility, the, you know, the, how the information moves, how the product moves, for example. That's the first thing we look at. You can see here as well, when you look at the, you know, the, each of the five steps, it's not one step that does everything. So what happens is whatever happens in step one, that then needs to be transferred on to, to step two. So that handover is important. When we hand over information, from step one to step two. How do we make sure we hand it over right? 
So remember we talked about the idea of SMED and, you know, think of the analogy we talked about in terms of the relay race. SMED is a concept related to handover. How do you hand over something? You hand over information, hand over product, hand over knowledge, for example. Because if you hand it over and if it's not right, that's going to cause you a problem. Okay. So we're going to talk about that idea. If I go back to the front end of the process again, or really, you know, the front end of any one of these steps. Imagine if you could design it such that it would be physically impossible to allow an error to go into that process. So if somebody's ordering something online, imagine if you could design the website such that it was physically impossible to order the wrong thing. That'd be very, very useful. Imagine you could design something and it was physically impossible to put in your wrong details. That'd be very useful. Or when it comes out of one process and it moves into the other one, again, it's physically impossible that it would do the wrong thing. Because if an error is allowed into the process, you know, think about somebody applies for a course somebody applies for a job and the name or the email address is wrong, it'll enter into the system. At some point in time, people will realize we have an error here. And that error has to go back and be corrected. Okay. So ideally, if you can design a system such that it won't allow the error to come in in the first place, that's ideally what we want. That's a concept called poke okay Japanese term, it's to do with error proofing. How do you design something such that it's physically impossible to do the wrong thing? And the other one we look at is a concept called a Kanban. Because, you know, imagine as information or product or something flows through that process. What you're trying to do is make sure that have we enough materials? Have we enough resources? Do you need everything you need? And if there are problems or issues, can we flag them? And can we get some idea, is is everything going okay? So this concept called Kanban is is literally a flag. It's a trigger. It's some way of visualizing what's going on. It's some way of seeing, are things moving? It's some way of flagging. We need to do something because if we don't, there's a chance the flow will stop. We'll run out of materials, for example. So we'll talk about a few of those. And we'll talk about probably a couple of other ones as well. But two that I want to talk about that are really, really important are one, a process map as in how do you physically see what's going on. And the second one is a value stream map. So process map, as the name suggests, is it maps a process. And literally what it is, is it's going to show you the sequence of events. Imagine you were going to make a cup of tea. Think about, you know, the recipe for a cup of tea. There's a defined sequence, right? So you would boil the kettle, for example, before you pour the water into the cup. You know, you wouldn't put the water in first and then boil the kettle that was empty. There's a defined sequence in terms of how you do it. And that's really what a process map or a process flow diagram, it's the same terminology. It just shows you that sequence. Now, one way you could do it is a bit like a recipe in a book. You could verbalize it, you could write it in words. Or the other way you could do it is you could draw it as a diagram, which is really what a process map is all about. So in very simple terms, what a process map is, it just shows you the sequence of activities. It shows you the sequence of information, whatever it is. It does it in a defined sequence. And it's a graphical technique, so it helps you to understand the process. And it's much easier to visualize, you know, what are the steps involved in a process, as opposed to sometimes writing it in Word as paragraphs to try and figure out what it is. It's much easier to do that. And the benefit of doing that is, you know, if you have a load of people and they all interpret different ways of doing something, if you can draw a process map and then look at everybody else's process map, it's a very useful way of saying, oh, yeah, that's a better idea. Let's do that or agree how that's going to happen. And for that definition, I suppose it is a very, very useful. It's probably the most useful improvement tool because the easiest way to improve anything is all you do is you find a big wall and you get a packet of post-its, and you just literally map out what are the steps, you know, what are the steps involved in whatever process we're looking at, and where is the value-added steps, and where are the non-value-added steps, and are people doing things differently, and how do we standardize what's the best way to do it? Simple as that. And so, of all of the tools that you look at, of all of the tools you'll ever, ever use, just drawing a very, very simple process flow, and whether that's in a mind map, whether that's in a post-its on a wall, the more tactile you can make it, the better. 
the simpler you can make the tool, the better. Because people then don't become afraid. Sometimes what people do is they go off and they draw all these process flow diagrams in some complicated software that we'll have a look at now in a few minutes. But if you do that, that actually frightens people to get involved because they're more worried about how am I going to draw it as opposed to what the, the, the whole intent is. So let's look at a quick example of what a process flow diagram would look like. And let's use this kind of strange scenario as an example. So, you know, if you look at the picture, you kind of get the gist of what's going on here. So our two friends obviously were driving along the road and they obviously got a puncture and they've pulled into the side of the road and they've decided we need to fix the puncture. So if you think of the process, there's a sequence of events that go on here in this process. And think of it like a journey, right? So the journey obviously had a, you know, there was a, there was a start. And down here at the bottom, there's going to be an end of a journey. So our process will have a start and will have an end. And maybe the first part of the process is, you know, they're just, they're driving along the road. And then what they do is they get a puncture. Okay. And maybe what they do is they stop. But then when you think about it, there's a kind of a question or a decision we need to make. Because if the puncture was on the driver's side, you might decide to do something different than if the puncture was on the passenger side. Let's say, for example, in this scenario, if the puncture is on the driver's side, maybe it makes more sense to park on the other side of the road rather than do what they're doing here. So if the puncture is on the driver's side, maybe you go one way. If the puncture is on the passenger side, maybe you do something different. Maybe you stay where you are. Then maybe what you need to do is you need to go through the process of changing the tire. So wherever you ended up, you have to do that. And then what you're going to do is you're going to, you know, drive off again. So you can see here that there is a defined sequence. Now, we could write that in words or what we could do is we could draw it in a diagram. And it's much easier, obviously, to read it as if we drew it as a diagram. So this is a very simplified version. You can see here that there's a start. And there's an end. So every process flow has a start and it has an end. You start the car, you drive the car, you get a puncture, you stop the car. You now have a decision. Is the puncture on the driver's side? If the answer is yes, what we do is we go over here and we park on the other side of the road. If the answer is no, well, we don't park on the other side of the road. We just carry on as normal, whatever the other step would be. We remove the wheel, but to remove the wheel, we need certain things. We need inputs, we need tools, we need a jack, we need a spare wheel. There's an output of that process. The output of that process is that flat tire that has to go somewhere. So you can see here that we're using different symbols to try and make this process flow a bit more understandable. If everything was a rectangle, then it wouldn't be as easy to understand what's going on. So you can see that this symbol here, this um, rectangle with the rounded edges, um, is the start of a process. The activity is usually a rectangle. The decision is a diamond. And you can kind of get the gist of why it's a diamond because the idea maybe is you enter into it, so you come down from the top, and then you ask a question. And depending on your answer, you can go different routes. So if the answer was yes, you might go this route. If the answer was no, you might go this route. Maybe if, if both tires were punctured, maybe you go out this route. You know, in that case, ringing the A might be your only option. The input or an output, a parallelogram is used just to signify an input or an output. So you can see here there's different symbols that are being used, and these are kind of standard symbols everywhere you go. So if you look at any process mapping um, piece of software, and we look at Excel the next night, you'll see all of these symbols. And they're all kind of standard symbols. A connector, for example, would be, imagine if you had this process flow diagram and if it was much more detailed and it was longer. So when you got to the end there, it was effectively going to fall off the page. What you might do is you might come along and you might put in you know, the letter A and a connector on it. So you just have your circle there. And then when you go on to another page, you start off with the letter A and then you continue on as normal. And that's how that works. And the other one that you know is there is the document. It's just a rectangle. 
with a rounded, like a, a page out of a book. And again, the reason you're doing these is just to make things a little bit easier to read. All of these are standard symbols. If you go into Excel, if you go into Visio, we'll have a look at a few of these the next night. It's a very simple example. What we'll do is there's a video um, already on Moodle to how to draw this in Excel. Maybe somebody wants to find a job, for example. That's what we're trying to do. So you can see there's a start and there's an end in terms of the process. So the first thing you might do is what we're going to do is we're going to look at job ads specifically in a newspaper. So you can see there the newspaper is an input. And whether you draw it as a parallelogram as, or whether you draw it as a document doesn't really matter that much. But you can see then that you know the, the newspaper is effectively kind of an input into that process. Again, if you follow the arrows. So the idea is you, they look at the, the job advert. Then they ask a question, do I see a job that's of interest? And the answer could either be yes or the answer might be no. If the answer is no, I'm not interested in that job, when you think about it, you just kind of loop back around again. And I look at the next job. And I keep doing that until such time as I see a job that I'm interested in. You know, if I'm not interested in it, I'm really pretty much going to stay in this, this kind of a loop here. I'm going to stay looping around here until such time as I see something I'm interested in. But if I do so see something I'm interested in, then I'm going to come down and I'm actually going to go into another decision. And that other decision or that other question is, well, have I got the skills to do this job? Great that you're interested, but will you be able to do it? Well, if the answer is no, then guess where you go? You go back to review jobs again. If the answer is yes, yeah, I am interested and I have the skills to do it, then maybe I'll apply for it. So what I do is I revise the CV and maybe I have a CV already, an old one. So when I revise it, maybe that's an outcome. Maybe I write a cover letter. Maybe I don't have one already. So I've now written a cover letter specific for that job. And maybe what I do is I email it and I end. So you can see in that case, it's just a very simple process flow diagram. You can see in this case, it flows from kind of top to bottom, left to right. So that's kind of how we, how we, how we read things. Um, they don't always have to flow from top to, top to bottom, left to right. They can go in lots of different directions. But, you know, so you can see there that by using the different symbols, it does make it an awful lot easier, uh, you know, to interpret um, particularly things like decisions, inputs, outputs, for example. And you can see, you can see as well, just used by different colors, you know, it makes it a bit easier to read something. So I'll show you, or if you actually look at the video on Moodle, there's a video there to draw that exact process flow diagram on Excel, okay? And it shows you how to do it. And it's very much using just the insert shapes. Um, so if you look at uh, any Excel program, you'll see a file insert, and there you'll see insert shapes. And all you do is you pick off these little shapes, and then you just connect them together. So it's quite an easy thing to do. Once you've figured out how to do one, then they're all standard. But watch that video, and it'll show you how to do that. And if you can do it in Excel, you can do it in PowerPoint or you can do it in Word because all the Microsoft applications are exactly the same. Okay. Again, you'll see that on the video. Sometimes what you might want to do is you want to make something a little bit more graphical. You know, what you might like to do is rather than just having boxes, maybe we show, you know, people or we show inventory or we show equipment just to make it a bit more visual and a bit more easier to comprehend. Imagine you're working goods inwards. And you were trying to draw the process flow diagram of, you know, how does the goods inwards process actually literally work? So the material comes in and, and where does it go? So goods inwards could be in, in Tesco's, it could be in, a, you know, any warehouse. And the way it works is the, the supplier or the haulier or whoever is going to deliver the goods, they would probably ring customer service and they would say, I want to deliver material. And the customer service people would give them what's known as a booking slot. And they would say, arrive here at half eight in the morning, between half eight and nine. And if you do that, we'll take in the stuff. If you arrive later than that or earlier, we'll either tell you wait or we'll tell you come back some other day. The truck will arrive and what they will do is they'll take the materials off the truck and they might put it in some quarantine area or something like that. Again, this might be a slightly older warehouse. So maybe what happens then is the person in goods inwards goes off and checks all the documentation make sure everything is right. 
if it's right, then what they really need to do is figure out where are we going to put it, what location do we put it in, and then eventually they might take the material and put it into um, a pig face. You know, if, if you have an automated warehouse these days, that's all done automatically for you. But again, what you're doing here is you're trying to visualize what does that look like. You know, you can you can see the product coming in there. You can see the the phone, so it's easier to to visualize it. Whereas if that was just written in text, you'd be less likely to remember that. You could have a scenario where you might want to just describe, you know, how does a process work? In this case, how do you generate electricity? You know, how do you have fuel and air, something to burn, something to heat water, for example, would produce a steam, which generates steam, turns a turbine, generates electricity. And then what you have is you have hot water, which goes into a condenser, cooling tower, for example. So all you're trying to do here is you're trying to visualize how does the thing work. You know, you try to draw it as a process flow diagram. The value stream map that I've talked about is actually a process flow diagram as well, because what is a process flow diagram? It just shows you the sequence of events. But a value stream map is a slightly different thing, because it always starts with the customer, and it shows you at a very high level what's going on. Okay, again, we'll look at that in more detail later on. When you look at any process, though, it is very, very important to remember that, you know, sometimes when somebody says to you, what's the process? And they pull out the procedure and say, oh, these are all the steps that we do, you know, so these symbols might represent different steps. This is exactly what we do. If we're making a product, this is how we do it. You know, if it's a, a tablet, it's dispensed, blending, granulation, compression, packaging, release, whatever it is. These are all the steps. And this is all the material we use. And these are all the tests we use. And this is the process. Well, if somebody said, well, okay, that's great. Would you mind if I go out on the floor and just see what do you actually do? So when they go out on the floor and say, okay, you said you were going to do these steps here, but I noticed that you're actually doing a whole bunch of other steps as well. What's going on? Well, we had to do those because, you know, the original process that we got authorization to do didn't really work. It had an awful lot of errors. We had yield issues. So we decided we'd do other we had to do other things and some of the equipment broke down so we had to get different equipment from different people and we had to change the supplier for certain raw materials and say well you know you can't do that so within any regulated industry you can't do that so what you say you're going to be doing is what you have to do and if there is a discrepancy then you either can't make that product or you have to go back to the original process and suffer the consequences in terms of yield or whatever. But you just can't say, well, I propose to do something, but in reality I'm going to do something different because the consequence is too great. But if you are in that situation, and that does happen, you know, not necessarily on a big scale, but on a small scale, if you want to map your process, you have to map what you actually do. There's no point in you know, mapping or convincing yourself you're doing something else Okay, by all means, you need to know what you propose to do. But in reality, you need to know what you are doing. And if there's a gap, you need to manage that. Okay? There might be a third scenario to say, well, ideally, I'd like to just reduce it down quite a bit. But, you know, what's really, really important here is you're honest with yourself and you map what you are doing. And then figure out, have I a gap or not? Is there a reality? So you have to map reality. You know, it's a bit like saying, if you're trying to find somebody, or um, if you lost something, I'm sure you said that, you know, you've heard the joke where somebody is standing under a lamppost looking at something and saying, well, you know, what are you doing? And um, somebody, so, so the person says, well, I lost some money. Um, and they said, where did you lose it? Well, they said, I lost it over there. And the argument is, why are you looking for it here? I'm looking for it here because it's brighter. But not much point in doing that. You know, you need to map what you do in reality. And that's very, very important. I keep mentioning process map and I keep mentioning value stream map. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, what's the difference between the two of them? Sometimes people still get confused, but let's be explain it very succinctly here. And let's be clear. Process map is usually some sort of a discrete group of activities as part of a much bigger process. So let's say, for example, you have one step which could be blending, granulation, compression, you know, um, uh, could be part of any process. And if you mapped that process 
in greater detail, that really would be a process map or a process flow diagram, where you take one process and you go into it in a lot more detail. The benefit, obviously, is you understand that activity in more detail, which is good, and you could figure out how do you improve it. The downside of it, though, is that one activity is a completely isolated activity if you just look at that activity on its own. Because over here somewhere, there's a customer. And if that customer changes their mind, by you just looking at that one activity on their own is a big problem. You don't see whether that has been a change there or not. So in many cases, the process map doesn't take into account the overall process and particularly the customer requirement. So like I said, if the customer changes their mind and says, look, I don't want that step anymore. Well, if you keep trying to improve that step, then you've clearly been doing the wrong thing. Um, if the demand goes up, the question is whether that step will be able to do it or not. So when you look at the value stream map, the value stream map is the whole thing. Like we've said, the value stream map is a very, very high level overview of what's going on. Always starts with the customer and it looks at the high level steps. So if you looked at a value stream map of um, you know, a manufacturing facility, the number of steps we're talking about here, we're talking about you know, five or six or seven high level steps. So again, if you were making a tablet, for example, it would be dispensing, blending, granulation, compression maybe, uh, release, packaging, shipping. It's that level we're talking about. It's really what are the high level things we're doing, not down into the micro detail in terms of how do you do that. That's kind of down in the process flow diagram. So hopefully you can see here that there's value in both. You need to be able to do both. You need to be able to see the high level of what the demand is going to be. What's the high level way of doing it? And then once you know what the process is, how do you make that process better? So you need both of them. But you always start off the value stream map because that starts and ends with the customer. And the last piece we're going to cover in, in this video, we're just going to talk about process mapping in a bit more detail. And what we'll do then the next evening is we'll go into the assignment in a lot more detail and we'll start looking at value stream maps and process maps and we'll start looking at some of the examples that are in them. So value stream mapping. So what is it at this stage? I think hopefully we know at this stage that this word flow is important. It shows us at a very high level the flow of information which then becomes the flow of materials maybe which becomes the flow of product through an entire enterprise. So an entire enterprise is something that starts and ends with the customer and everything in between. And what it does is it shows us what the demand is and it shows us how that enterprise or that business is going to deliver on that man demand. And it shows us the value add and the non-value add in that entire supply chain. Also what we can do is we'll see later on there are certain things we can measure here. We can measure critical parameters. We can measure things like cycle time. We can measure yield. We can measure um, you know, volume. We can measure waste, for example. So when you look at any process, you, know, you can measure what's its throughput, what's its capacity, its capability, all of that kind of stuff. Because again, you, you, just by looking at it won't be sufficient. You'll have to be able to measure something there. So measurement will become important. Like I said, they all start with a customer, okay? So this is just a different representation. Um, so the icon over here, it's like an old manufacturing facility with again, the slatted roof. That represents the customer. And normally what you do here is you, you describe one product or one service that the customer wants. You know, if you think of a supermarket, for example, and you were trying to draw a value stream map of a supermarket, if you tried to map every single product that goes into that supermarket, Think about it, it would be complete chaos. Because how the fruit get in is different to the meat, different to the wine, different to the cakes. So what you do when you draw a value stream map is you pick one product or one stream. If you were in a pharmaceutical plant, for example, and you were looking at vaccines as opposed to solid dose, as opposed to creams, you pick one product because otherwise it gets too complicated. In some cases, what you'll see is you'll see this kind of, a, you know, a squiggly line here. And there is certain symbols that we'll use and that we come across. And really what it means is it talks about information flow. And, and if it's kind of a jagged line like that, it actually symbolizes that it comes in in electronic waveform. So it comes in, whether it's via the Internet, via some system. Really what it's saying is the, the information, the, the demand 
coming from the customer is coming electronically into the person in sales or in production control. Think about most organizations that comes in electronically these days. So this is the kind of the central unit that schedules or controls, uh, plans what's going on. So in one sense, what it does is it sends information out to the suppliers. And again, a lot of cases that's electronic. But also what it does is it sends information to each one of the, the process steps. So whether that's through some sort of a manufacturing execution system, some SAP system, some sort of a workflow system is how it works. So this is really the controlling. This is the piece that understands the demand, can make a decision, can we make it or not, and then controls the whole activity. The suppliers over here on the, the left-hand side, again, it uses the symbol, kind of, a, you know, just a, an old manufacturing facility. That's what it does, uses that symbol to be suppliers. And again, the truck really just symbolizes or visualizes the shipment of raw materials into the organization itself. And then what you have is you have a series of process steps. So each one of these process steps is shown in sequence. And we see later on, we can measure things. So these boxes later on will be to do with data, waste, yield, cycle time, all that kind of stuff. And when you think about it, you know, you can also measure things like inventory. So there's a triangle there that has the letter I in it. That represents inventory. So how much material is at any one particular location at any one particular point in time? So if you think about it, if you can see the flow of materials, that can give you a very good indication of whether something is working or not. And then there's a whole lot of other things we can, we can add on to it. So the more detail you can add on to the value stream map, the better. Like I said, they all look like that, so no point in valuing that anymore. I keep referring to this idea that something flows. Something flows within the value stream. What flows is it starts off with demand, and that demand gets converted into request, gets converted into request for raw materials, which then gets converted into raw materials, which comes into the facility. And then what flows is that product being made or that service being provided. So if it's manufacturing, it's the material is the thing that's actually flowing or the ideas. If it's a designer development, it's the designs, for example. If it's service, it's whatever the customer is looking for. That's the thing that flows. If it's administration, again, it's whatever the customer is looking for. Okay. And again, like we said before, if something doesn't flow, then you have a problem. I said earlier on that you can measure certain things. So if you looked at you know, one of those steps and those internal processes, let's say for one of those, it was packing the product. And if you think about, you know, what could you measure about that process step that would be useful? Well, you could measure how long does it take to set it up. Imagine if this was um, putting a tablet into a thermoform, into a blister, which then goes into a carton, which goes into a box. You could look at how long does it take to set that up. You could look at how long does it take to pack one item. You could look at maybe what the yield is, the waste is, the energy consumption, the right first time. There's certain things that you can measure. You know, so you can measure cycle time, for example, for each step. So how long does it take to get from, you know, the input of the step to the output of the step? How long does it take to pack one item in this case? That would be maybe the cycle time. So you can look at things like, you know, how long does a step take? Setup time, accuracy, yield, how many resources, how many people do you need, installation, energy. There's a lot of things you can measure around each step as you go along. And obviously the more detail you can collect then all the better. And how would you draw one of these things? Imagine if you're working in a company and somebody said, well, draw a value stream map. Well, the first thing you do is you decide what process are you going to map. So if I'm in a supermarket, for example, maybe we look at wine, maybe we look at meat, maybe we look at ice cream, maybe we look at milk. You pick one process. If you're working in a pharmaceutical plant, for example, you might say, well, let's just look at solid dose. Let's just look at this particular product line, for example. Uh, let's look at something that's similar. So we decide exactly what it is that we're going to map. We form a team of people from all of the different departments, right from the customer right through to planning, suppliers, to manufacturing, to release. And what you do then is you literally start at one end of the process and you walk your way through it. And you physically walk your way through it 
and sometimes you collect as much information. So what you do is you get a very, very big wall and you start to map out the entire process. So you start to map, you know, what is the customer? How does the demand come in? Where does that go? What system does that go into? How is that then communicated to the suppliers, for example? And like I said, you know, whether you're using post-its or something, because the advantage of post-its is it's very tactile. It's very easy to just, you know, put something there, decide, actually, no, we're going to move that. We're going to add something else. It's just very, very tactile. It's also a very good process to get people engaged. You know, if you were sitting there with Visio or some complicated piece of software, most people would say, well, I don't know how to use that and I'm going to keep away from it. When you do that, then that helps you to identify where the problems are. And then what you do is you go and use the tools that we'll talk about next to try and improve things. And that's the methodology. And most organizations will do that. The downside sometimes what organizations do is they decide, let's come up with a series of projects and projects sometimes by definition can be, let's fix something that's broken. So you might have a piece of equipment out there and it's broken, therefore you might decide that's a project. Not necessarily the right thing to do because if there's no demand for that piece of equipment, don't fix it. No demand. Okay, So you need to figure out what impact does that project have on the overall value stream? That's what's important. So last couple of slides before we finish for the evening. What you might do is you might start off and you map your current state. And again, this is a very, very simplistic view of what's going on. You might realize, well, in this case, there's five different steps in the process we have. And maybe what we do is realize, actually, there's a couple of steps here we don't need. Maybe we can get rid of step two or step four. Maybe we can combine it with something else. And then you end up with maybe there's just three steps in this process. And maybe we can make it far more efficient. So what we're going to have a look at the next night is we're going to look at some examples. And again, these are kind of simplified versions of products. And we spend a, look, a little bit of time looking at these. And I'll show you real examples or kind of more detailed examples. And, you know, this could be, I'm sure you're familiar with Prevnar, you know, at a very high level if you were making it. Let's say, for example, you know, if there is a, a demand for, in this case, 1.7 million syringes um, every month. So if that was the demand coming into, into Pfizer for that demand, then you'd be looking at, well, what are all the different raw materials that you would need to make up that product? You need packaging, syringes, excipient, loads of different things. And then when the material comes in, there's a process. Goes inwards, dispensing, equipment prep, formulation, filling, inspection, release, packaging, shipping. You're really looking at it at a very, very high level. And then what you have down here, and we look at it more detail the next night, is you have more data in terms of how does each step work. And by looking at that at a very high level, then you can figure out where are the issues and how do we improve it, for example, as well. Um, this is another example. We look at this one in a bit more detail the next night. If you take something like Cornflex, what's the value stream map there? How does it actually work? We won't zoom in now, but we look at it in more detail the next evening. And what you'll find as well is when you look at the value stream, there's a lot of different symbols that are being used. Some of them I mentioned earlier on, you know, the idea of the, the outside, whether it's the customer, whether it's the supplier, uh, you know, the, the electronic information coming in, um, the inventory, for example, the data about each process step. So we look at some of these. Um, and the more detail, obviously, you can get in, the more then you can start to design it. You know, is it a, is it a push system? Is it a pull system? Um, can we level load things? Again, we'll talk about some of these things uh, the next evening. Okay, so what we do is let's finish up here. Um, think about where we're at. Okay, we're looking at this idea of value. Like we said, value is something that's defined by the customer. Remember the Kano model said there are things that you have to have, there's things that people are willing to pay for, there's things that are delighters. Also remember the customers change their minds. The idea of the value stream was this idea that what is the process that you're going to use to make the product and provide the service? How do you map that out? When you map that out, you realize there's actually waste in what we do. There's 10 different types of waste we talk about, but in reality, there's an awful lot more. And then the next piece we're really going to look at is, well, how do we now start to design this to make it better? How can we fix the layout? How can we prove the handover? How can we error-proof things? How can we flag things, for example? 
which is really what we're going to focus on the next night. So what we'll do the next night is we'll spend a bit of time looking at value streams and how do you draw them. And I'll be giving you loads of templates to do that. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll start into some of the tools in terms of how we do that. Um, we'll have a look at some of the examples that are up there. And um, then we'll have a conversation around value add and non-value add as well. We'll also look at the assignment and we'll spend a bit of time understanding the assignment because the assignment you'll be working on will be on a value stream of a of a business, some imaginary business. Um, and then we look at how do you make it better. Okay, so let's finish up here with this video. Um, I'll be with you the next week and uh, we'll have a physical class and then we'll talk about the assignment then as well. All right, hopefully that makes sense. So if you have any questions the next night, just take note of them and we can come back over them um, the, next, uh, the next Monday evening. All right, take care, folks. Thanks.